everyone. We've added this note to the beginning of all of our original episodes of the podcast to let you know of a few changes that have happened around here and hopefully avoid any confusion for you as listeners. When we began this podcast, it was called Starseed Survival Guide, and most people called me, your host, by my birth name, Erin. Throughout the first 22 episodes, you'll hear me introduce myself as Erin, hear others refer to me as Erin, and hear many references to the name of the show being Starseed Survival Guide. In 2018, more and more folks began calling us Yaya, and in March of 2020, we changed the name of this podcast to Earthside Survival Guide to more accurately reflect our intentions for the show. For a little more of the full story of what these changes mean to us, please check out episode 23, a temple talk where we reflect on where we've been, where we are now, and where we're going. We thank you for your patience during this transition, for listening and sharing this journey with us, and most importantly, for allowing us to continue to grow and evolve. Blessings. And as I call in the east, I walk into the stream, and as I call in the south, I bring water to my mouth. And as I call in the west, the creek swallows my chest. And as I call in the north, I am swallowed by her soul. It's me, Yaya Erin Rivera Merriman, and today we will continue to explore an important theme in our life, which is the medicine path and what it can offer those who are wired just a little bit differently and end up manifesting severe chronic health conditions when their needs are not met by the prevailing social and ecological paradigms they were born into. We will be joined in just a few minutes by a certified Cambo practitioner and founder of the San Diego-based nutritional supplement company, Antheozen, Caitlin Thompson. Uh, but first, I wanted to just say a few words about how I even became interested in Cambo medicine in the first place. I believe I first discovered Cambo when I first learned that the mother goddess of my Taino ancestors called Atebera is a rather cosmic and androgynous looking woman with a large headdress and frog legs. To this day, the totem of the people of Boriquen, known more commonly by its post-Columbian name of Puerto Rico, is a small tree frog called a coqui. After pulling the frog card from David Carson's animal medicine deck an almost laughable number of times in a row, I'm sure you know how that goes. I ended up taking my inquiry to the limited yet totally serviceable Akashic Record library we call Google to see what we as a species have collectively amassed and agreed to about the sacred role of frog in the planetary ecosystem. I learned of regeneration through the Rana Sylvatica Arctic wood frog who comes back to life after being frozen. I learned of taking up more space from the frogs that will only grow to the size of the aquarium provided, but if you provide them with a larger space, they will expand to fill it. And I learned of Vaccina do Sapo, more commonly known as Cambo, the purgative healing medicine of the Phylomedusa bicolor tree frog. Now I come from the wise woman tradition, which often invites us to examine our love affair with dramatic purgative plants and experiences and the sometimes self-loathing perspectives and paradigms that accompany them that tell us that the body is filthy and that we must engage in endless cycles of purification in order to be well. I also grew up seeking health in the Western medical system where many become discouraged by a health diagnosis where our doctors admit they have no medication, no treatment, no cure for us. I've personally felt very liberated to receive these kinds of diagnoses that freed me from looking in places where I was unlikely to find relief. I felt empowered and like I was given an ultimate permission slip from the system to get creative and use my own intuition to heal myself. So when we hear of an original earth medicine or non-pharmaceutical approach to healing symptoms presenting in our lives, 
We like to do our research and be informed by others who have walked the healing path before us, but then ultimately put all of that available information to the test of our own direct experience. We employ questions like those suggested by the Buddha regarding right speech that can be applied to more than just the words we use. So, when I'm getting to know an illness that's presenting in my life, or maybe have lost myself in a sea of others' projections and I'm searching for breadcrumbs to help me find my way back home, I like to ask myself, is this practice effective and useful? Is it the appropriate time in my life to engage it? How do I feel about my facilitators? What do I need to know about them in order to be able to relax and be fully present to my experience? What are my intentions for seeking this experience? And is it harming anyone? Now, we're not going to rob you of the pleasure and self-awareness that comes with questing your own criteria for determining what you do and do not engage in in the name of health. And we don't profess to be able to save you the effort of going through whatever process you may need to to gather information that you will personally need in order to feel that you can safely, responsibly, appropriately merge with a new frequency or medicine or plant and take responsibility for any results that you may have. What we do offer here is just a window into the journey of myself and another Western-born woman who has found relief from so-called chronic illness through a combination of nutrition and cambo. So finally, the last thing I wanted to mention before we welcome our guest is just that this episode does contain the usual amount of crude language and adult themes, including an in-depth discussion of sexuality and consent as it does or does not occur in the natural world, and what this may mean for us as humans. So, you know, invite you to use your discernment and to just check in and see if now is the best time and place for you to listen to this episode. And as always, we hope you enjoy... Welcome, Caitlin. It's such a pleasure to have you on the show today. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be on the show. (laughs) So to start off, I would love to have you just explain for anyone listening who's not familiar, what is Cambo? And then how you came to be walking this pretty unusual path as a Cambo medicine practitioner in, you know, in my opinion, a really grounded and accessible feeling way. How did Mm -hmm. that happen? (laughs) Yeah, so Cambo is a traditional Amazonian medicine, and it comes from the skin secretion of a very specific type of tree frog. The species is called Phyla medusa bicolor, and the um, secretion is actually a defense mechanism for the frog. Um, it, they rub it all over themselves, and it helps protect them from fungi and bacteria and viruses, but also protects them from predators because when you get a mouthful of it, you um, it's not that fun. And so the way it's administered is through very small burns made on the skin, usually on the upper arm or the spine or the torso somewhere. And you apply this frog skin secretion to the burns and um, it induces this very intense purgative effect. And a lot of the peptides uh, have been scientifically studied and are actually in the process of becoming pharmaceutical medications, and many of them have been found to have potent antimicrobial, uh, anti-cancerous, anti-inflammatory immune modulating properties. So they're highly medicinal, and there's hundreds of them um, in, in the secretion. And so while the experience of taking Cambo is um, a little bit rough and uncomfortable, it's very short. It's like 20 to 30 minutes of vomiting, sweating, um, and some other interesting sensations and just kind of feeling like you have a stomach flu or food poisoning for a short bit. But then afterwards, there are a number of amazing medicinal, uh, spiritual and physical benefits. And so people with all sorts of conditions are getting relief and healing, uh, such as depression, anxiety, um, addictions, or chronic inflammatory illnesses, autoimmune conditions, chronic infections like Lyme disease, herpes viruses, Epstein-Barr, our gut uh, microbiome dysbiosis, uh, chronic pain, like the list goes on and on. And there's also a very strong spiritual element to it, despite it not being hallucinogenic. 
Um, there's no psychoactive properties to it, and yet it's still able to evoke these potent emotional and spiritual experiences in people. And it's, it's so unique. It's really unlike any other medicine that I've ever come across. Hmm. Yeah, I definitely experienced that way. Being nauseated is one of my least favorite states to be in. So I was very concerned and really questioning myself. Are you, are you really feeling guided to do this? Why are you doing this? Why are you doing this to yourself? Uh, but I was pleasantly surprised at the quality of the purge, how um, it felt very intelligent and effective, and how afterward, like you said, um, it felt really renewed and, uh, um, I guess, creatively available if that makes sense mm -hmm. just like really cleared out and so i could see what my creative energy looks like when there's not a lot of stuff piled on top of it and it was beautiful <laughs> so uh, really grateful for that experience and i would just love to hear you sh if you're willing to share with us a little bit about your past your upbringing what led you to find Cambo and then um, pursue becoming a practitioner? Yeah, absolutely. Well, first I'll just say like many other practitioners, um, the frog recruited me. It, it wasn't really something on my radar or even um, that I thought I would ever do with my life. But uh, I think a lot of people can agree that the frog calls you and kind of just decides that you work for it. And if you try to fight it, then it doesn't go well. Um, but yeah, I, I was brought to Cambo because I had my own chronic illness. And really, as a, as a child, like pretty much since I was born, I can't remember any point, you know, that I wasn't sick. And I had a lot of chronic fatigue growing up, a lot of pain, a lot of depression, anxiety, um, a lot of malabsorption. I was very thin and nutritionally deficient despite being an eating machine. And um, I just overall lacked a resilience to stress and a, and a vitality. And I always intuitively knew that something wasn't right. It, I didn't know why I had to sleep 12 hours a day while all my other nine-year-old friends, you know, only had to sleep eight hours a day. But I knew something was not right. And um, at the time, nobody was really listening. Um, and they, you know, doctors were like, oh, she's fine. There's nothing wrong with her. And it wasn't actually until I was an adult and I was going through my undergraduate degree studying neurobiology that I actually kind of discovered my um, health condition. I had started to make changes, dietary changes experimentally, just kind of like, oh, I wonder what will happen if I cut out gluten. And, um, stuff like that. And I started to discover uh, that I actually was more sick than I realized because sometimes you don't realize you're sick until you feel a little bit of healthiness. And having that contrast um, really highlighted to me like, oh, I've just gotten used to being sick. I don't even know what it's like to feel good. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of like the beginning of my health journey. It started with, you know, dietary changes and stuff. But of, and I had been to the jungle. I, I drank quite a bit of ayahuasca and I had had experiences in Peru and um, Brazil and Ecuador. And I had heard about Cambo, but it never occurred to me as something that I would want to do. Um, I guess it sounded kind of radical and like not real safe. And I, I just, I just didn't have enough information to feel called to it at the time. And then a friend of mine, um, had come over and was telling me, yeah, I've been getting real deep into this frog medicine lately. And I'm like, frog medicine, you mean like the stuff they do in the Amazon where they burn you and you barf and it's awful? And he's like, yeah. And he started to tell me about all the amazing just opening that it was doing for him spiritually. And I trusted him and I thought, okay, well, if this friend of mine is uh, getting benefit out of it, maybe there's something I've overlooked here. So of course, me being the curious adventurous soul that I am um, I went with him to do my first ceremony and 
little did I know, honestly, that was the true start of, um, of my healing process. Like I felt like the, the other steps were kind of preliminary, but I didn't quite know what was going on yet. And the first time I did the Cambo, um, I had no expectations. I didn't really know what was going to happen. I, I didn't even know why I was doing it. I just felt called to do it. And immediately that first experience, I had such intense healing happen. I remember it was the first time that I could recall that I wasn't in pain and it just felt amazing to sit in my body and not hurt. And I also was getting these major downloads about uh, what my illness was caused by. Um, and as far as spiritually speaking, I hadn't quite figured out the, um, the scientific explanation, like, oh, you know, Lyme infection and small intestinal bacterial overgrowth and blah, blah, blah. Words to describe, you know, somebody whose body is not in balance. But I was getting these massive downloads about uh, a lot of ancestral trauma that I was carrying. And um, it had come kind of through my mother's lineage mainly. And it had been propagated like this spiritual infection passed down over the generations through interaction and also through epigenetics and actual, you know, physical tagging of gene expression, which is a very real thing. And from that moment on, I just, I realized that my body was having these autoimmune mechanisms happening because it was literally trying to attack this energy that was in it that was foreign. It truly didn't belong to me. My body knew it didn't belong to me. And yet it was really confused about where it was actually located. And so my physical body was attacking itself, but really it was like a metaphysical affliction. Hmm. And so just having that awareness that the Cambo brought to me in real time and removing it and telling it that it can't be there anymore, that was the beginning of uh, an exponentially productive healing process that unfolded over the next two years. And, and also about that time, my life kind of completely fell apart. Like the house I was living in for almost five years, I had to move out of, um, which is good because it had mold in it. And, uh, you know, financially I was struggling and, and romantically I was very confused about, you know, whether to pursue a certain relationship. And there was a lot of stuff going on and the, the frog medicine really catalyzed so much of this old stuck patterning and just bulldozed it to build a castle, you know, and it took, it's taken a couple of years for the process to kind of wind down, but I see it time and time again with um, people that I do treatments on that this medicine, it can be like this catalytic um, shifting energy that can just upheave your entire world, but for the best. Hmm. Beautiful. There's a particular lens that I have on everything that I'm hearing um, where I just understand reality through the goddess cosmology. And mm. so it's just, it's helpful and it translates everything for me to put everything in terms of hmm, what goddess does that sound like? What, cause I think of goddesses more as like blueprints or, or circuitry or particular um, forces of nature that just are, and different cultures have given them different names. And so I bring this up now because it is a major reason why I first found you was that uh, I'm part Taino, which is native Puerto Rican, and their mother goddess uh, is called Atabeira, and she's a frog goddess. She's part oh. woman and has these frog legs and frog toes. And so I really 
was wanting to connect with the idea of this, when I say mother goddess, I mean a goddess that's both a goddess of birth and death. So anytime that they have one goddess for, for birth and death, that to me is shorthand for like, this is the complete spectrum. This is all that is. This is a non-dual tradition where everything is sacred. If you could put those two um, roles in one container. Um, mm. And so the things you're describing about how you started working with the frog medicine, and then th there was this like bulldozing of all of your um, stuff and trauma and karmas. It's very Kali to me. And Kali is just, you know, the tantric and tantric wisdom goddess who also kind of is like the full spectrum the bliss and the hell that <laughs> we can that it is possible for us to experience as humans so your story your experience with the way cambo came into your life the, the flavor of the healing it is confirming for me uh like oh yep that's atabera that's kali that's that full spectrum mother goddess the frog is that and that is another like point of interest for me as a plant spirit medicine person was to say, hey, this actually isn't plant medicine. This is yeah. animal medicine. That's what's that going to be like? What's that difference? It does have a difference. And one of the main things that I've observed with frog medicine versus plant medicines um, is that there's more of an essence of sexuality in it. And I think in part is that's because animals are more sexual, at least in the, the way that humans can relate to sex. Mm. You know, we physically mate, um, animals physically mate with each other, whereas plants are more, they have a lot of diversity in how they mate and how they reproduce. And it's not always um, as sexual of an experience uh, as when animals do it. And I find that because of that, this frog medicine, one, it tends to draw a lot of people with sexual trauma because I don't think a plant, a plant can understand that quite as well as an animal can. Hmm. Um, and also I've noticed that the frog medicine um, can, can kind, kind of, you know, well, it, it helps with fertility, which is one thing. And also um, just to like move energy through the reproductive organs and, and energy sensors hmm. and also help reunite people or unite them in, in the first place with partners and lovers. I do see that a lot where people will have a big cambo stint and then all of a sudden they are meeting the love of their life and entering a really wonderful relationship. And mm -hmm. that was certainly the case for me where I was you know, not sure like, oh, should I move forward with this relationship? And the frog was there and kind of leading me that direction and, and all for the best. Wow. So are you saying, because I, I like that you have a slightly more or much more scientific lens than I do. So are you saying that like one of the the physiological properties of Cambo medicine is like that it it moves energy or circulation in the reproductive system? I mean, that's speculation. Nobody okay. knows that for sure. <laughs> but certainly on an energetic and sensory level, um, you know, I can, I can feel quite activated after doing Cambo and that is consistent with what I hear from women is they can just feel more charged in their sacral and root areas um, and possibly just more engaged sexually, more aroused sexually, able to receive and uh, give sexually more. Mm. So it's just something I've noticed with animal medicine versus plant medicine and Granted, I haven't really explored with a lot of other animal medicine. I haven't done really any bee, bee therapy or anything of that sort. So I don't know if that's for all plant or all animal medicines. Mm -hmm. It's an interesting question because I've definitely had some experiences of laying down in a field, even just like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have a little bit of kava and I'm just going to walk, uh, take a nice walk on this property and I'm going to lay down and look at the sky and having what felt like a very vigorous nature spirit, like just 
come start like making love to me and feeling like, wow, this feels awesome, but there was not even a split second of consent assessed here. <laughs> um, so I have this kind of idea about how the natural world makes love and how I've had a Diné medicine woman define shamanism as understanding that we live in a sexual universe like that was her definition of what shamanism is is like like that you can see that everything is in continual sexual exchange mm. uh, so the way that the plants do it and the way that the elements do it perhaps there's just a way in which they're connected to the oneness like they're they're literally rooted into the body of the mother so they're not separate from it so maybe that's why they don't have this concept of consent and they're totally surrendered to like the bees coming along and pollinating them and, and whatever happens. Uh, but maybe there's something about when you become two-legged and you, can't, you're, you are separate and you're not rooted into the earth uh, where there really is a self and an other that oh. then consent evolves over time so say like sea turtles do not have consent and bed bugs do not have consent they reproduce in a very rapey way <laughs> but but they're you know m most people would agree that they perhaps their consciousness is not quite as um nuanced as ours so there's something about this idea of like with evolving consciousness comes evolving responsibility mm. for creating processes of consent and that the concept of consent is actually um, one of humankind's greatest art projects at this point that we are, have been working on and we're actually getting to a point where most people like can have a conversation that says yes we agree like consent is absolutely non-negotiable so like you know all of that yeah um, that's definitely interesting i i would agree with you that nature is a bit rapey and um <laughs> You do see like in some of the higher mammals that are more close to us on the evolutionary tree that they do have social behaviors that can act as ways of consenting, but that certainly doesn't mean that they're not getting raped. Like, you know, I think about horses or dogs and stuff and yeah, they have their way of saying, yeah, I'm into it. Let's, let's mate. But then they have plenty of times where now you just take what you want. Um, and people aren't that different. You know, we see that a lot culturally where Although we are fully aware of the concept of consent, um, it isn't quite implemented 100% of the time, unfortunately. But you're right, I think it's a, a sign of um, an evolutionary process in consciousness and just a consideration for a being that is considered separate, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I was just delighted to hear you, know, you start talking about that just those dynamics of, well, how is this different? How is plant and animal medicine different? And that for you, that that manifests as a way in which the medicine expresses or uh, has wisdom or, or instructions around sexuality, because these topics are, you know, super alive and interesting for me. And I certainly um, didn't think that we would go there um, mm -hmm. today. And so I just love hearing, um, different perspectives coming from different traditions on those subjects because you mentioned that ancestral understanding the ways in which your contemporary physical ailments were connected to uh your ancestral line and your place in that um ancestral process uh i absolutely experienced that just in the one session that we had together where i would feel calm and then I would start thinking about a dynamic such as something about my mom and dad's relationship, some, some pre-verbal observation uh, where I had no memory and I had no words for it, but a sense of, oh, well, he died before they could work that issue out between the two of them. So now, like, I have this undigested dynamic in my mm. system and it's now mine to to deal with um, and to, to transcend or learn. And then I got super nauseous and then I purged a whole bunch and then I felt calm again. So there was this really direct correlation between like my ruminating on or observing, oh, my parents had some, some things going on in their relationship that I've never really consciously acknowledged how they affect me, how they affected me. And then 
comes the purge, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and then thinking about some past lovers and then comes the purge. So it was (laughs) definitely uh, um, clearing my second chakra. um, And I could absolutely see how uh, a long process with Cambo could really prepare you to meet like a long-term love and not pile all of your ancestral habits or um, unresolved issues on that relationship. So just, you know, be able to see, oh, you're actually wonderful and this is actually a good thing and like, let me not shit all over it. (laughs) Right. Well, you know, sometimes you got to clear stuff out to make space for something amazing. And that's really what it feels like with the Cambo and and it just gives you such a sense of clarity. It's, it's quite amazing. Like, you know, you, you sometimes are confused about what you really want or how to get there. And this medicine just, it shows it to you, but in a kind way. Um, and it's just, it's so different than something like ayahuasca or other psychedelic medicines. It's, it, it feels like it is a, a, a mind expanding substance but in a very different way. It feels like, you know, uh, have you ever seen Nightmare Before Christmas? In the beginning, you're in the forest, and each holiday has a different tree with a different door. It feels like Cambo is its own separate door from psychedelics, but, but you can kind of understand, for those that have had psychedelic experiences, that um, ability to feel like you're entering another realm of consciousness but it's so different and distinct from any sort of psychedelia experience. Well, my first real path was with dream work. And so it helps me to think about like, what are these different states of consciousness or access points or do they take you different places or do they all take you on a a different looking path that ultimately leads to the same place? Those Mm. kind of questions. And, um, For me, it's helpful to think about, because I'm sure there's people listening that, you know, are not interested in exploring psychedelics or have not um, gone there yet. And so the way that dream work will talk about the different levels of dreaming and how it's fairly common for people to, at some point in their life, experience a nightmare, a regular mundane processing dream, some kind of dream that feels super important and like, oh my God, like this has rattled me to the core and I I am going to make changes. And then a lucid dream where like, ah, I could do whatever I want. I'm going to fly. So right there, that's four different states of consciousness that we're labeling dreaming that are distinct and that most people can, can tell you could talk about what that distinct flavor was like. Um, And so then more dream yoga people and shamanic dreaming people will say there's 13 levels of dreaming. So it's been really interesting for me to try to put things in the context of by dreaming, we're just meaning different states of consciousness. Mm. So dream yoga is really about this idea that you would be able to um, ideally remain fully conscious through the entire sleep cycle and um and through through all different things that could happen during a a waking cycle different emotional states or whatever um and so i find i'm now going to look at cambo in that way in you know subsequent journeys as do i feel that this is taking me to a state of consciousness that i have accessed through any other means or do I feel like this is, is a different level of dreaming uh, and, you know, could potentially be a way of mapping those 13 states, which is something I'm very interested in doing in this lifetime, is really having a, a firm conviction about, like, what the 13 levels are and, and how, um, what the best ways of accessing them are and why you would want to do that. Like, what would, why each one would be indicated for what kinds of questions or learning or um, healing. Right. Yeah, that's, that's very interesting, too, because I find that the Cambo really does operate through dreams as well. Mm. Uh, A lot of people will have dreams about the frog before they've even heard of Cambo, including myself. That was something that happened to me several years um, before I, you know, even did it. And um, I, I constantly am dreaming about the frog and it's constantly bringing me messages and you see the same thing in a lot of other people that have had the Cambo experience. So 
yeah, I'd be interested to, um, you know, hear what your take is once you have a little bit more experiences with it, then see if, if Frog reached out to you in your dreams and, you know, what that feels like for you. I definitely had one, <clears throat> which was the week before when we had our, our session scheduled and I was having a really busy week with a lot going on and wasn't really focusing on preparing in any way for the time together, which is not really my style. I like to really try to clear a lot out of the way before I'm doing something that I hope to be a sacred experience. And so I had a little bit of questioning about that and being like, am I blowing this opportunity by just being totally like overwhelmed with like doing a million things and not really tuning in? And so the day before I like canceled a bunch of, of plans to just be like, I'm just clearing things out to have be more available and focused on this experience and 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 questioning looking for any signs like am I really supposed to do this <laughs> um, and or, or am I doing this for the right reasons am I truly being guided or like do am I doing something heroic where I just am not going to trust that I'm I'm healthy unless I've done some some super heroic ordeal you know yeah. um that was the questioning um because i i work in the wise woman tradition which is doesn't really work with any of the plants that would indicate like purging is very much like purging is this heroic thing tradition thing and we're doing something else so i was in that questioning and then i had this dream of just kind of shape-shifting with this like white iridescent kind of frog but kind of like um just a, a massive um being with a little crown it was very much like this galactic frog queen energy and it it just kind of was like okay that was definitely a sacred being and that felt good so i guess I got the clearance <laughs> to continue. Awesome. Stamp of approval. Yeah. I I just, uh, I need a lot of like guidance saying like, yep, yep, yep. Cause you know, it's loud, it's loud out there and there's a lot of things speaking and a lot of energies pulling people in different directions and cravings and addictions and habits and you know, so yeah, <laughs> need that. Now, I needed that ultimate stamp of approval. Mm -hmm. Um, so now I know you have a background in neurobiology and that you specialize in mood disorders and mental illnesses and have studied nutritional neuroscience uh, for helping people overcome their chronic health struggles. And uh, you mentioned uh, your own chronic illness really being the the doorway and the guide along your journey i'd love to just hear a little bit about um you know what came first the cambo or the entheozen the process of formulating products um that you now make available um under the label entheozen uh or, or what was going on in your world when you first had the inspiration or confirmation of like, I actually really understand some of these nutritional compounds and how they affect the brain. And um, I am going to make an, an offering around this. Yeah. So that story. Um, so yeah, it was, it was in my, my undergraduate degree um, where I was, you know, studying neurobiology and, um, I know that not all your users are uh, into psychedelics, but it is kind of relevant to the story. Um, at that point in my life, I was going to a lot of festivals, Burning Man, I was going to Peru, doing ayahuasca. Like I was having a lot of consistent experiences with psychedelics. And then when I kind of got into the harder classes of my undergrad, like the last year or so, I just kind of dialed back a bit and took a break because I wanted to really focus on, you know, kicking ass in school. And what I found was that around the seventh to eighth week mark after my last psychedelic experience, my 
my chemistry, like my brain chemistry would get progressively more just imbalanced. And I would feel like I was chemically unraveling around that time consistently. And I would get more irritable, more depressed, just like off. And finally, after like three or four times of seeing this consistent pattern around the exact same time, I pinpointed like, oh, I actually think I have like some chemical, you know, depression or, or you know, definitely a physiological um, induced depression. And I'm medicating with psychedelics and cannabis. And my, uh, my family has a history of depression and um, autoimmune conditions as well and things like alcoholism and stuff of that sort. And all this time I thought, oh, I got lucky. I didn't, I didn't get hit with that. But then I started to realize, actually, I think I did. And I just have been medicating quite effectively with the psychedelics. But that's cool and all. But I wanted to get to the root of the problem and, and find tools that were just a little more accessible because it doesn't always make sense for you to take 10 hours, you know, to have a psychedelic experience and it's also illegal. And sometimes you don't know the quality of the black market supply that you're getting. And there's a whole host of reasons why it's nice to have other tools than that. And so I just started becoming obsessed with the scientific literature on mood disorders, like depression, anxiety, psychiatric conditions, just trying to understand what was happening to me. And uh, I found that nutritional components are actually pretty crucial to a lot of these biochemical pathways that do things like produce neurotransmitters such as serotonin and dopamine, or um, you know how inflammation is also a driving factor of a lot of these psychiatric conditions and the nervous system is actually inflamed. And so as I begin to dig around into the actual scientific literature, and I was doing a lot of experimentation, trying all these different herbs and nutrients. And so it was kind of a combination of like an intellectual pursuit and an intuitive experience. And finally, I was like, how come doctors don't know this? Like, <laughs> how come doctors don't know that people with depression tend to have this deficiency, this deficiency, this deficiency? How come they don't know that B6, vitamin B6, is a fundamental cofactor in the process of making neurotransmitters? How come they don't realize that you know brain cells are made mostly out of fat and they generally need fatty compounds to rebuild their cell structure? And if you're deficient, you, you can't build a brick wall without bricks, you know? <laughs> and so I thought, man, I got to do something about this. Like, luckily, I'm, I'm starting to make some headway. And granted, I was just at the beginning of my understanding of what was actually going on. And now I realize, like, my depression and anxiety was a result of chronic Lyme infection, gut dysbiosis, um, what some people would call PTSD as far as uh, a nervous system that is in this chronic stress response and highly uh, dysregulated and desynchronized and blah, blah, blah. There's tons of words that I can use to describe it all. But ultimately, um, there was a lot going on and it was causing me to feel depressed. And so I, was, I wasn't even done with college yet. I had started thinking about this as an idea. I was like, I need to make a supplement that employs all of these concepts of neuroscience that I've come across and been having good success with personally. And I need to make this available to people because it's just not fair that people have no idea. And it's like the literature is there, but not everybody has a science degree and is able or, or even motivated to go and read all of that science in order to understand the bigger picture. So I really wanted to somehow be um, like a, a, a conduit for taking the information and like chewing it up for them, digesting it and regurgitating it defeats my little baby birds, you know, um, so that they could reap the benefits of the research that I had already done. And so I started Entheos in uh, literally two weeks after I graduated, like I had everything pretty much ready. I was just waiting to get to get my last semester of college out of the way. I graduated in December of 2013. Um, and then, you know, there was the holidays. And then January 2nd, had my LLC. 
And um, then within three months, I had my first product. And, you know, I am a biologist that became a businesswoman. So it's been a huge learning curve. And there were a lot of a lot of mistakes and, and pivoting and, and product retargeting, rebranding, remanufacturing, reformulating, blah, blah, blah. But at this point, now I'm pretty clear on what Entheosin does, uh, what we offer, and the, the science of the product and the efficacy of it. And so now we have um, a, a mood enhancement and stress support product that's doing pretty well and the sales are growing consistently. And it's sold mostly on Amazon at this point, as well as my website. And then uh, hopefully in the next month, I'm, I'm working on it right now, but we'll be launching a psychobiotic, which is basically a probiotic um, specifically for brain and mood health. Because as some of your listeners may know, the gut brain connection is just on fire right now, as far as the research and the medical implications of that. And so you know, the Transcend, which is our mood enhancement product, is more vitamins, minerals, amino acids, and plant extracts. And then this psychobiotic product that's called Zenbiotic, it's uh, more targeting the gut origin of nervous system dysfunction. And they're really quite complementary to each other, which is wonderful. Um, so yeah, and in addition to offering the products, like really the most important thing that I want to do with Entheosin is to continue to create educational media that empowers people to take their mental health into their own hands because unfortunately our our medical system while their intentions are good maybe um, they're they're not that helpful to a lot of people with these chronic complex illnesses and psychiatric conditions especially depression the antidepressants we have now are um, not super effective. They are sometimes, but they, they're they just a little bit better than a placebo. Uh, they have all these side effects. And so I wanted to make something um, as far as the, the informational contents and a product that people could really solve the core issue, which is generally that their body is not being properly resourced. It's inflamed. It's dysregulated it's deficient in things. And, and ultimately, I think there's also a strong spiritual component to a lot of people's manifestation of diseases. And so just by providing uh, contents that can shed light on that for people and help guide them through the process of healing the entire body, the, the mind, body, and soul, while the supplement just gives them some relief in the meantime while they do the deeper healing, uh, but I really want to encourage people to uh, hit it from all angles, really. And just the supplement's just there to help. Mm. Mm, there's so much that, so much in that part of your story that is super alive for me. Um, I guess I just, I want to look at everything you just said through this lens of, the idea that this show is called Starseed Survival Guide and um, that that I really mean it <laughs> in, in the sense of I hope that anyone who identifies as other, <laughs> you know, when you see the list of things that you could choose from to say like, well, what are you? And you're like, oh, crap, the thing that I am is not even on this list. What does that mean? <laughs> um, and for me, it often means like, maybe you really are something else that hasn't been, um, uh, we haven't figured out how to support, like this planet doesn't actually know how to support the kind of being that you are, and your parents certainly didn't, and my parents certainly didn't, and so then we ha have these these chronic illnesses, they, they, you know, they labeled yours chronic fatigue maybe, and they labeled mine fibromyalgia, which I have heard called a wastebasket term for when <laughs> they test you for everything under the sun and you don't have it, but you still definitely have symptoms. <laughs> so, so they're like, well, yeah, you're in a lot of pain. You're, very, you're definitely very uncomfortable. And there's, we can't see anything going on with our methods of testing and diagnosis. So fibromyalgia and the way that you spoke about growing up and just 
knowing there was something wrong, I had that same feeling where they were like, well, you're just depressed and you think something's wrong. And um, it, you just must be depressed. And I was like, I don't feel depressed. I mean, like a lot of pain and I'm, I'm, I'm convinced something is wrong. And when I would go to ceremony, the, you know, medicines and elders would, would be the only people that would confirm like, wow, you're so sick. You're so sick. And then I'd go to Western medicine. They'd be like, you're fine. There's nothing wrong with you. Um, Here's his antidepressants. You want to see a psychologist? (laughs) Yeah. And um, so the the way that the thing that that is most meaningful to me about that part of your story is how you really actually needed to take matters into your own hands and you needed to explore these like very uncommon things and then do a lot of research and then start you know a business so you could conceivably continue to spend lots of time in this inquiry and uh, be compensated for it and not yeah, have pretty to much. <laughs> put all your energy into a job elsewhere that wouldn't like leave you any energy left for what you're really passionate about exploring and i believe what you've just narrated is is the process for so many star seeds where it's like you know what it's not here you're right when you feel when you feel like it's not here and this planet can't support me and people can't, don't know how they don't know how that's actually your dharma is to create the language create the vocabulary create the community processes create the medicines that enable you to be here because you do have the right to be here and you do have something of like great value to share and you're you're making a way so that all the others of your kind whatever your kind is will arrive here and just be like yeah of course like there's support for me they'll never know that feeling of not being supported that you experience because of the work that you do to spell out and educate and share about these relationships between you know emotional health and brain health and um and then specifically i believe there's a separate protocol for medicine people so if you're a medicine person you're a practitioner, you're in healing spaces with others as like perhaps your full-time thing, that has a a toll on your nervous system separate Mm -hmm. of any trauma or physical healing things. So that's a high demand um, path or career path. And so I've been playing with the idea of making some kind of a PDF super condensed um, guide called neurotransmitter support for medicine people. Mm. And I've kind of, that was an original inspiration that I had. And I think that my apprenticeship has kind of turned into that, but expanded beyond neurotransmitter support to just say like complementary life practices for medicine people. Because if you go to the jungle or for me anyway, the traditions that I've contacted you can learn the songs and you can learn the technologies and you can learn how to be an effective medicine person. But I've never been taught by any of those traditions the self-care that needs to accompany that in order to not be a martyr and not burn out on that path and not die super young and just go, oh, well, that's what spirit asked of me. No, I don't think that's the way anymore. I think we actually can be really abundantly resourced and well and be practitioners, uh, full-time practitioners. It doesn't have to be um, uh, a burnout. Yeah, like you said, it comes down to being resourced. And, you know, if you're um, driving a car and you don't fill it up with gas, it's going (laughs) to stop. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. And there's definitely a lot of traditions that kind of say, well, you just, you get your attendants and they run alongside the car and they dump the gas in the car for you. So you never have to stop for gas. And that also is like, yep. And then you leave a a lumbering trail of burnt out assistants and uh, students behind you. Nope. That tradition, that approach doesn't, doesn't fly with me either. I think we have to be a hundred percent responsible for being well, which is what you've done is like, you're trying to figure out your own chemistry and what you need to be supported. And it just so happens that you can share that with other people, you know? So you're Mm -hmm. really an example of this 
maybe it's not new, but maybe it's just traditions I haven't found yet. But, you know, to me, new way of embodying the path of um, being a healer. So thank you. Um, I'm excited to uh, have connected with you. Yeah, thank you. My pleasure too. And yeah, I think you you said something that, um, you know, I felt into as, as really true is like the more that I succeed in um, recovering my own health, the more, the more I have to share that will make me successful as a business or, you know, as a practitioner or whatever. So it's really just kind of like a, a doubly amplified um, gain for me and everybody. And it, that feels really good. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, like when you say doubly amplified game, it's like people will set gain. Uh, some people will say like, oh yeah, like look for the win-win. But I've found that the reason why people don't don't go for the win-win, they go for the like, well, either I win or you win. Um, it's you or me kind of thing. Um, is just that it, a you have to believe that a win-win is po- always possible, and so that's like a um, a precept or um, a hypothesis that I have really taken on, that the win-win is always possible. No one ever has to sacrifice their health for someone else's health uh, or their energy for someone else's. But it takes a little bit longer to find it. And it takes communication, which scares a lot of people to find it. Um, But furthermore, if you're really on that path of saying, you know, I know that there, that there's a win-win way to do this, that it, it's, it could feel really good. Um, and that then there's also like the win, 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 where it's not even like, it's not even a question of like, Oh yeah, look, the two of us both worked it out and we're mutually satisfied and there was no compromise. It's a true win-win, but like where it becomes in X, when it's truly aligned, it's exponential where, um, if what you're walking with, your beliefs, your offerings are, are actually medicine, then they're going to they're gonna always benefit and it's going to always be a win. Yeah. yeah, I've definitely seen that myself. Yeah, it's how you know it's true. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's perfect. How you know it's really true. Um, so because my particular also angle into my healing journey has been fibromyalgia. I I, uh, have had it since I was 16 years old, spent every dollar and every moment of free time since I was 16 going to yoga classes, uh, you know, power animal journey, sweat lodge, Reiki, every modality in the West possible as like my hobby as a 16 year old. Um, I really tuned in with this idea of how trauma can create this this PTSD um, condition of oversensitive or like hypersensitive nervous system then that's that's part of the few things they know about fibromyalgia they say okay it's usually caused by either an immune system event such as Lyme disease or emotional trauma and the way they talk about it is that this event switches on some it flips a switch in your brain that can't be unflipped as far as western medicine goes right new tools for unflipping the switch that makes your brain hear pain louder than other people so less stimuli will cause more pain so something like exercise where it's known that part of the exercise cycle is that your muscles tear themselves apart and then come back together you're not fibromyalgia person experiences that as like a tolerable degree of achiness and a person with fibromyalgia experiences that as like excruciating pain for like potentially 10 days uh, because you hear that process louder Um, and so I was excited when I was on your blog and just saw you breaking down a little bit of um, what complementary modalities you suggest um, to accompany the um, protocol the nutritional protocols where you're really guiding people that it's a two-part thing there's the nutrition and giving your body all the raw materials it needs and then there's the resetting the nervous system Um, so I would just love to hear you um, list or talk about some of these 
complementary modalities that reset the nervous system, specifically because Western medicine is indoctrinating people to believe that it's not possible to reset the nervous system. And that is perhaps one of the most um, damaging spells out there for people that have illness when you're told like if you get if you have trauma and you get this switch flipped or your nervous system becomes sensitized you're basically a, a, a cast off or a reject like you get thrown in the garbage in this culture like you know a lot of people with ptsd can't work can't have a relationship so just really wanting to unweave that spell right now and say there's not only one but many many different traditions mostly not western that specifically address the resetting of the nervous system and that in fact it is imminently resettable. It is designed to be resettable in our Absolutely. resilience. Yeah, well, first and foremost, um, it needs to be physically resourced. It needs to have access to nutrients, building blocks. Um, it, you need to remove as much inflammatory uh, triggers as possible because you're, you're not gonna, it's not gonna be healthy enough to actually learn and, and adapt if it doesn't have what it needs to be neuroplastic and such. So step one, resource the nervous system. That's all the nutritional protocols and stuff. And then as far as actually retraining the nervous system, there's a lot of different things, um, a lot of different angles that you can hit it from. Um, for me and probably a lot of other people, when your nervous system's like super like, ah, you're like super inflamed, you're, you're what I would call excitotoxic, um, it's really hard to just sit down and meditate because you sit there and your brain's like, it's like spinning so fast and you're not going to get anywhere. You're just going to feel agitated uh, sitting still for so long. So I think doing a kind of a gradual, um, gradual way of, of getting your nervous system closer and closer to stillness. So like in the beginning for me, medi uh, sorry, exercise was the the main form of meditation that I could really tolerate at that point, because I really needed some, some physical movement to just disperse all this like nervous energy. And then as I started to get healthier, I would, I would do things like Qigong, which is like kind of like meditation and incorporates some breath work, but there's still movement. So I don't feel like as twitchy and then I started to kind of move on to things like float tanks, sensory deprivation float tanks, um, and just get more used to the idea of being still. But it's nice because you're actually removing all stimulation in that environment. So that helps you if you're not quite good enough at just ignoring stimulation. Um, and then, you know, I've done a lot of also just emotional work. So, you know, there's, there's things like, you know, breath work and meditation and, and flow tanks and Qigong, blah, blah, blah. And that's kind of training the physical nervous system. But I also did a tremendous amount of somatic therapy, somatic talk therapy, uh, like polarity therapy or cranial sacral work. Um, and also just resolving some stuff with my family and my parents. And it's actually kind of amazing how um, me rebuilding and healing a relationship with my mom has perfectly coincided with huge leaps in my recovery. And I don't think that's a coincidence. And I've done some, some soul retrieval exercises as well, where, you know, I go back in time and I find the child version of myself that's feeling stressed out and insecure, living in a chaotic, um, just conflict rich environment as a as a child and just feeling unsafe and feeling unsupported by any of the parents because they're in their own chaos and um going back and comforting that little girl version of me and literally just like convincing my nervous system that it's safe you are safe and also needing to feel safe in my present day like having you know going into a stable relationship made made me feel safer and was better for my nervous system making more money helped me feel more secure and and actually made a tremendous difference in calming my nervous system down um 
And then, you know, I had to do all of that stuff. And then kind of the last piece for me was actually doing real sitting meditation. And it, it wasn't until recently, actually, it was November. And me and my partner, we did a Vipassana uh, meditation retreat. And I probably meditated like three hours of my entire life prior to that. And it was always a challenge for me. I, I never felt motivated to meditate. I didn't even feel like I really could meditate because my nervous system was just so noisy and um, in this flight or fight, like hyper vigilant state all the time. And so sitting in meditation felt completely useless. And that was one of the reasons I wanted to do the retreat was I felt like I needed something to force me to just be still and be quiet enough to flip that switch like you described. And I had been doing all this kind of gradual work up to it, you know, getting the nutritional stuff set and then, you know, breath work that helped and then Qigong and then um, float tanks. And then I also did a number of neurofeedback training hours, which um, was helpful, but it's very expensive. And honestly, I feel like you could probably get better results with mindful practice, mindfulness practice. Hmm. So, um, you know, while I was grateful for having that neurofeedback training, it didn't seem to stick because it wasn't self-induced really. It was, Hmm. it was, um, you know, me responding to a program that was trying to train me, but it didn't seem to stick very well. Whereas when I went to the Vipassana, um, yeah, there were several days of discomfort as I was, you know, my joints were on fire from sitting in posture and we meditated like 16 and a half hours a day and that's all we did and it's a silent meditation you're not talking to anybody there's no stimulation you're you're not supposed to read write listen to music really do anything except be and that was exactly what i needed and i came back from that experience and i felt like i finally really flipped the switch which was exactly what i was hoping to get out of it And it has truly been transformative for me. And now I have a daily meditation practice, which I kind of never thought I would be able to stick to because there's a lot of things that we should do. And we go, oh, I'm going to try to do this from now on. And we just don't. Uh, But seeing seeing the results and also getting into the habit, I just made it a mandatory part of my day that you sit in posture, even if it's for two minutes, you just do it. And it's quite astounding how much my physiology has changed. I have to tell you, um, ever since that meditation retreat, I, you know, I came back from that retreat and my cambo business exploded, which was a big cause of stress for me as someone with a chronic illness and not able to really work in full capacity and struggling to pay for all my medical treatments and supplements and home cooked food and blah, blah, blah. And, um, all this stuff just kind of unraveled after the meditation retreat. And now my nervous system is just, it feels like it's just so much more balanced, so much more even keel. And I'm not as reactive to stressors. I'm not as reactive to food assaults because I've had a lot of food sensitivities and um, I'm just, my nervous system is not getting spun out nearly as much. And a lot of downstream processes like with the immune modulation and the inflammation and the, and the joint pain and skin issues, it's, it's all kind of starting to resolve uh, the longer I do this meditation practice. And so now I like really can't emphasize enough that like the nervous system is a fundamental piece to all of this. It's like, yeah, maybe you have Crohn's disease, maybe you have Lyme disease, maybe you have this and that, but the nervous system really runs the show, which explains how trauma um, can be translated into physical illnesses because the nervous system, it controls almost all of the processes in our body, especially in the gut, um, where, you know, it, it, it basically dictates digestion and the gut environment, which will influence what type of microorganisms live there, which that has a whole array of consequences as far as inflammation, uh, protection from pathogenic organisms, production of neurotransmitters, um, extraction of nutrients and vitamins from food, you know, digesting food in general. Like there's a, a whole host of reasons why having 
a proper microbiome gut flora population is crucial for all health, but especially nervous system health. Um, Because a lot of people don't know this, but actually the gut contains um, more nerve cells than your spinal cord. And that's kind of astounding when you think about thick bundle of nerves your spinal cord is. And there are an equal amount of nerves innervated through your entire GI system. Um, So when you think about it in that context, you can really understand how the gut and the brain are connected and why people with trauma develop these gut overgrowth or these um, irritable bowel syndrome diseases and uh, imbalances and digestive issues. And then it's a two-way street, then that getting all messed up makes the nervous system more sick and inflamed and unhealthy. And then you're just caught in this vicious cycle and you really have to treat both the nervous system and the gut and like I said, the, um, the nervous system has to learn to feel safe. And that might involve uh, purging some, some really deep stuck emotional trauma or feelings that have kind of just sat in the nervous system unconsciously. Yeah, I love how you broke that down and also feel like there's definitely another show or two in there with you <laughs> because um I I am very uh, deep in this journey of understanding the gut brain connection and um I have been on the gaps diet for 14 months now which is Uh, an intestinal healing diet and the person who created that Natasha Campbell McBride uh, says that the the neurological activity in your gut that basically there's a second brain in your gut that's as neurologically active as a cat's brain and that it talks to the brain in your head and it and it actually tells you what to do so when you think oh I just have to go get a bag of potato chips right now it's actually not you it's the pathogenic material in your gut like Mm -hmm. telling your brain to go do this thing that does not will not be creating health and that 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 it's the same for when we become addicted to unhealthy relationships when we're like, I know this is not a healthy situation and I cannot stay away from this person. Why? It's bad every time, but I just keep doing it because there's literally pathogenic material in your intestine that's um, telling you to go do this thing that's going to release adrenaline and other um, chemicals in your body that feed the pathogenic material so so they're basically like we need to eat so you need to do a bunch of dysfunctional things that are harmful to you so that we can grow this colony of more bacteria that's harmful to you uh yeah it's kind of trippy it's like somebody hijacking your your brain and even your emotional centers and um just meticulously mind controlling you to like you said feed it what it wants which is like whoa maybe i'm not as a control um, of my consciousness as i thought (laughs) well i'm pretty convinced that a lot of what was referred to in scriptures in the past spiritual traditions where the shamans were picking up on spiritual illnesses and they were saying okay you have this entity in your belly or in your third chakra i'm pretty convinced that you know you could substitute entity or demon for bacteria uh Mm. and that it's the same. It's, it's a conscious, there is consciousness yeah. there. And so it doesn't really matter how you think of it. In my opinion, we're both just as long as we understand that we're all referring to the same thing yeah. and um, that you could approach it through a spiritual or through a, a physiological lens. Um, but why not, as you said, hit it from all angles and why not approach it from both? If you'd like to heal faster, um, do the different levels of your body, your energy body and, and your physical body at the same time. Why, why not? Yeah. Well, and, and that's really fundamental I find is because they're, they're all different expressions of the same truth. You know, yeah. mm-hmm. it's like, yeah, you can come up with a biological explanation, like, Oh, there's a bacteria or you can come up with a spiritual explanation like, oh, there's a dark energy that needs to be cleared. And 
those aren't mutually exclusive. They can both be simultaneously uh, true and they can be different versions of, of the same truth. Yes, I love that. Um, Cause sometimes science and a uh, mysticism are set up as, as you know, oh, um, either or or an antagonistic relationship that, that just doesn't need to be there. It's just like, you know, science is a different house of magic where they're studying phenomenon and they're trying to to um, create solutions. And yeah, um, that we're all on the same team and different language appeals to different people that have brains that, that are wired in different ways. Um, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I love the way that you you bridge both of those worlds in your work and um, really uh, look forward to continuing to explore these topics with you. I, I feel really blessed to have connected in the way that you've, you've gone really deeply into both the gut health and the nervous system and their role in healing as like those are... Um, I think critical components in trauma healing specifically. So um, it's just so cool that you're local and that we can um, continue to raise the consciousness around what people need to, to reset and truly heal in this community uh, and then live to enjoy the, the um, community wide well being for a long time. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, and if anybody wants to get in touch with me, um, feel free. You can you can go on my website. Uh, it's www.entheozen.com. It's spelled E-N-T-H-E-O-Z-E-N. Um, and I like like um, Aaron said, I have some blogs on nutritional uh, tools and protocols that can help heal the brain and the gut. Uh, and if anyone feels also compelled to reach out about Cambo Frog Medicine. My website is medicinefrogcambo.com. So please reach out if you have any questions, comments, or just would like to connect. Thank you so much. And I'll put those links in the show notes for anybody who wants to follow up and connect with Caitlin Formal. Thank you to you and all the benevolent beings and all the realms who have gathered and inspired and directed the flow of this conversation. We dedicate any merits accumulated through this work to the benefit of all sentient beings. May all beings be healthy. May all beings be well. May all beings know joy and not suffer. Jai Ma. Amen. Namaste. Blessed be Aho. May it be finished in beauty. If you enjoyed this episode, if our way of doing things is speaking to you, if you're feeling it, we would really love it if you would go over to iTunes and write us a review. They actually really do help others find out about the show. And it would also be really amazing if you felt inspired to visit our brand new Patreon page, which is just www.patreon.com slash active culture family, where you can sign up to support the show. We get a lot of really beautiful letters and notes and direct messages and shares in your Instagram stories. And it feels really good to learn how what we're doing here affects you as listeners and what parts were most uh, resonant for you. And we also get a lot of requests for more regular episodes. And We've tried really hard this past year to move the pieces of our work and life and priorities around to make that happen and at this point are super clear that we just cannot commit to more regular release of all of these amazing episodes that we actually already do have recorded until we can figure out a way to get a few more dollars coming into the system every month. So. We want to thank Sunny Ozell for her very generous one-time donation made through the podcast page on our website. And then thank you in advance for those of you who are listening right now who choose to head over to the Patreon today and become part of this project's continuation. I know you know, but even just $2 a month can really go a long way toward enabling us to get the structures in place for all of our various 
earth magic education programs, which in turn frees us up to make new episodes of the show and make new medicinal foods recipes for our forthcoming cookbook and other educational and hopefully also entertaining resources, uh, getting those out to you more often. Thank you so much for listening and have a beautiful day.